and to be able to hear you minister to us through singing. It was in 1987 that I walked into a classroom that R.C. Sproul was teaching. Uh, Vesta came in on his side, and I intentionally went to Reform Theological Seminary in Jackson because I had read a book, The Holiness of God. And that book did something to me, and God did something to me. And as I considered how to be prepared for ministry, I wanted to be wherever this man was teaching and to be under his influence. I walked into that classroom, um, very rough around the edges, um, a young man who knew far more than what his maturity or giftedness should have allowed him to minister. And in that classroom, it was sanctified magic for me. Every sentence, every thought was used by the Lord to influence me. That was however many years ago, 23 years ago. I continue to carry that influence in my heart and in my ministry I, in one way or another, I think virtually every day. So many things that even my parents, my mother and father had tried to instill in me. As I was in that classroom, God used Dr. Sproul to finally get certain points across and to polish a very rough diamond that was in need of much sanctifying grace. And so I will always be thankful for that influence in my life. I think we all know who Dr. Sproul is. Uh, we know that he is the founder of Ligonier Ministries and that he has been mightily used by God around the world in this generation. I think more than anyone else to bring about the resurgence of the Reformed faith and a God-centered message for the church in this hour. And so it is with a, a deep sense of gratitude that he is here that I want to bring up now Dr. R.C. Sproul. Would you please join me in welcoming him? Let me say one last thing. would ask that no pictures be made with flashes. Uh, Dr. Sproul um, had a stroke a few years ago, and there are effects of vertigo that he deals with. And as he says, when flashes go off in his eyes, it makes him Arminian. <laughs> 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 and it really makes him wacky. <laughs> so for the sake of the body of Christ around the world <laughs> and for the cause of the evangelical faith, please, no flash bulbs, no pictures, uh, just your affirmation. Now, what we would like to do, we have these two microphones. I'm going to be seated. Uh, these are open mics. If you would keep your question to the point, um, this is not a time for group therapy. <laughs> for you come to the microphone and, and start when you were a child and work all the way up to your question. <laughs> uh, just ask the question <laughs> and uh, you can say an encouraging word to Dr. Sproul as well. But if you will be brief with the question, we will have more time for the answer and we will have more time for other questions as well. So. The mics are open, uh, the ball is in play, um, so who would like to come first? The game is afoot. Uh, the game, yes, yes, sir. Before play we take the first question, I have to mention that one of my good friends and colleagues is Dr. Peter Jones. Yes. 
who has done some magnificent work exposing the influence of neo-Gnosticism in the culture, particularly with New Age thinking. And I can't wait to talk to him and tell him about hearing a Southern Baptist minister talk about sanctified magic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. <laughs> I receive that in the spirit in which it's given. <laughs> so the, the, the adjective is more important than the noun in that. So okay. thank here you. Here we go, over here. <laughs> is it on? Is it on? Okay. I've been here for, this is my fourth year. I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, it's been very encouraging each year. Uh, there's been such a, a high honor of preaching and the sacredness of the pulpit and the message tonight talking about the, the, the giftedness of the preacher and the, uh, just the highness of the, offer, the office, the, the gravity of it. With this in mind, could you share some thoughts on the whole concept of lay preaching? Do you see it as legitimate? And I'm not talking about bivocational pastors that, uh, that uh, see themselves as called to preach, see their, their gift of shep shepherding God's people, and have a passion for doing that, but they're working in other ways to provide for their family. I'm talking about the one who feels called to, plum to be a plumber or a CPA or a lawyer, and they just preach on the side. Uh, do you see that as legitimate? If so, how does lay preaching demonstrate itself in the local church? And is the nature of preaching attached to the pastoral office itself? And do you see a difference between K. Russo and Uangalizo? Um I know that's a lot of things. I promise to keep it brief, but uh, too late. Could you <laughs> First of all, I, I have a, a bias in favor of lay preaching because my father was involved in that. And you mentioned accountants, he was a CPA, but from time to time he would preach in the local Methodist church in Pittsburgh where I was first baptized <laughs> after I made my profession of faith <laughs> at six months of age. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was one of those precocious kids, you know, <laughs> in those days. But my, my father did that uh, joyfully and out of a sense of uh, serving the Lord in a capacity other than his primary vocation, which was in the field of accounting. And I'm in favor of that. But, you know, we have an expression goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the difference between the false prophet and the true prophet of Israel, that some were sent and some went. And so you do have that class of lay preachers who have never been called by a church or under the authority of no Christian body, but they just go on and do their thing. And that has very dangerous uh, repercussions to it. I, I like involving lay people in preaching, but I think it should be done in the context of the church and under the jurisdiction of the church. So that would be my simple answer to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a race. Run that you may obtain the prize. <laughs> I would just ask as uh, one of, if not the preeminent uh, theologians in America, in my opinion, would you speak to what you see as the, some of the biggest challenges to the visible church in America and or reformed theology in particular? Well, there are so many challenges to the church in our age. Uh, Jim Boyce used to say, that the great danger that he saw in the church today was the temptation to do the Lord's work in the world's way, to be seduced by technique and by methodology. For that reason, I wish every 
pastor in America could have heard the message that we just heard a few moments ago. Uh, about particularly about the, the gravity of what we're about here and that we are to be delivering the Word of God. It's only been the last 13 years or so of my life and ministry that I've had a full-time position as a preacher on Sunday morning in a local church. Before that, I was strictly in the educational aspect of ministry as a professor in college and seminary and that sort of thing. But I would go and preach here and there and everywhere uh, at, at various uh, opportunities in various venues. And, uh, <clears throat> but whenever I had to take on the responsibility to teach to the same or preach to the same congregation week in and week out, it was a completely different experience. And I remember back when I was teaching in seminary where a student came to me and asked me a question knowing that I had spent two years in a church where I preached before I went into, this, or before I went into the academic world full-time. And the fellow said to me, um, what's it like for you now? Or what was it like for you then when you were just a pastor? And I've always said that there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I resolved as a professor to treat every student's question as if it were the first time I've heard it, even if I've heard it a thousand times, because it was new to the student and was important to the student. And so I never wanted to be sarcastic or cynical about any question was raised. But when that young man said to me, what was it like when you were just a pastor? I could not contain myself. I was angry. I said, what do you mean? just a pastor. Don't you understand there's no higher calling in this whole world than that calling? The reason I'm not a full-time pastor is that I don't have the gifts and abilities at this stage in my life to do that. God had one son, and he made him a preacher. But what we heard in Steve's message tonight is something that the Apostle Paul reiterates again and again in the New Testament that if we are pleasing men, we cannot possibly please Christ, as he said to the Galatians. And the great temptation in the church today is to redo church, to reimagine church, to reconstitute church, or just simple things. Simple things that I look at that scare me to death. I'll walk into a church and, I'll, and maybe, I don't want to step on any toes, but if I do, you know, here, here. That's, <laughs> I'm sure this has to be true of some of your churches. If I walk in your church and I see a plexiglass pulpit up there in the front of the church, <laughs> I want to run for my life. Because all forms are art forms, and all art forms communicate something. And what communicates to me when I see a plexiglass pulpit is that the pulpit is portable. It's not permanent. It's not substantive. It's something we can do without. Now, there may be other reasons to justify a portable pulpit, and I don't want to get into a big argument about that. But I just, when I see that, I wonder how much thought has gone into this. Do you realize what kind of a message you're giving to people? Where's the gravity? in a plexiglass pulpit. There is none. That's wood, hay, and stubble. Now, obviously, the size and the shape and the texture of this pulpit doesn't make the preacher and doesn't make the truth any more true or any less true. I understand that. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a symbol of what's happening. Of We want to communicate to the seeker as if pagans were seeking after God and design worship on Sunday morning for the unbeliever. What? When did God ever establish corporate worship 
for unbelievers. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the primary function of corporate worship was the assembling together of the saints, of believers, that they may give themselves to the teaching of the apostle and to prayer and to fellowship and to worship. But whenever we design our worship to accommodate the unbeliever, we've lost sight of what our mission is. We're not doing it now as stewards of the Word of God for God's people. There's a time and a place for evangelism. I understand that. But corporate worship involves much more than evangelism. It's proclaiming the whole counsel of God. And I would used to say, I started this by saying, you know, when I used to go around and preach here, there, and everywhere, or if I wasn't preaching on a given Sunday and I would visit various churches and I came in and sat there as a participant in the worship service, you know what I wanted more than anything else? My soul longed to hear a word from God. That's what I wanted. I mean, I'd studied the things of God all my life and was a professor of theology. But what I want on Sunday morning is to hear a word from God. I didn't want to hear the preacher's latest hobby or his therapeutic sermon or his pop theology. I wanted to hear the word of God being expounded from the scripture. But now I'm preaching. Go ahead. Well, I had the, much the same question, actually. And I wanted to know, besides the uh, sanctified magic in Southern Baptist, what was the most alarming development that you saw? And, and I heard that answered very well. And secondly, I wanted to say that I never had the opportunity to go to seminary. I started off as a free will Baptist uh, through the writings of Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and R.C. Sproul. Those uh, things are deadly to free will Baptists. That, that, it has been. It has been. It has been. And, uh, but I feel like I've not been deprived. I didn't get to go to seminary, but through your teaching, you have been much of my seminary, and I thank you for that. And uh, you've been a, a great light in my life, and uh, to my family, and now my congregation. And, uh, but I just want to ask, what, what do you believe is the most significant book that you've written? I don't have all of your books, and I say that for my wife's benefit. She's in the crowd. I do not have all of your books yet. <laughs> But what do you believe is the most significant work you've written for the good of the church and the good of pastors like me? And uh, I'll sit down and thank you, sir, for everything. Mm. You know, people ask me that frequently, and I'm not sure how to answer. If I look at the response of people out there who have read my books and the ones that have generated the most response, are certainly the holiness of God and chosen by God, those two seem to have been the ones that have made the most the, the, the largest impact through my writings. I've often said, uh, my little children's book, The Priest with 30 Clothes, may be the most significant thing I've ever written because it communicates the concept of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. So I, I love that little book. You know, Luther wrote over 50 volumes and Somebody asked him that question. What was your favorite book you ever wrote? Do you know what his answer was? It wasn't Bondage of the Will. It wasn't the Catechism. It was his commentary on Galatians. He called it his Katie von Bora. And so and I feel that way about my commentary on Romans, my expository commentary on Romans. I went on John. I just can't pick one, choose one. I, I enjoy uh, uh, Not a Chance, The Consequences of Ideas, my ex exposition of the Westminster Confession, Truths We Confess. Those all rank up there near the top. But sorry, I can't, I can't be definitive on that. Let's go over here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sproul, I'd just like to thank you, uh, first of all. I've lived in three states in my life, Michigan, California, and now Tennessee. And you have ministered to me in all three of those states through the radio ministry. Oh. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. I think you probably ministered to many of the uh, men and women in this room uh, in that. And related to that, uh, in, and in reference to the earlier question on the influence of the world in our worship forms, church, and even pulpit structures, 
Do you think that the church has also been adversely affected by our primarily thinking of preaching as taking place within the walls of the church versus preaching, which it primarily, I think, took place in the first few hundred years of church history in the wider culture and among those non-believers. So many times it seems like today most of our preaching, and especially as pastors, what we view as the preaching is something that's done to the church as opposed to the world around us. And there seems to be, in my view, little preaching other than perhaps radio and some television to the wider culture. And we seem compartmentalized and kind of marginalized in the church because of that. Should we see our role as preachers as taking more preaching opportunities in the wider world uh, as the New Testament church seemed to? Well, you know, you talked about, you look at the book of Acts and you see how the uh, apostolic church behaved. Paul, of course, everywhere he went, he went, where did he go? He went to the synagogue and he went to the agora, to the marketplace. And he was engaging people both inside, what we would call inside the church, and outside the church. And I think we should endeavor to do that. Um, and, I, and I think your concern is a, a valid one. Some of the greatest preachers that I've known in my lifetime not only preached in the church on Sunday morning, but they also preached on the street. Cornelius Van Til, the great the philosopher, theologian, and apologist, used to do street, street preaching in Philadelphia. My mentor, John Gerstner, would get up early on Sunday morning and go down to the Greyhound bus station and preach to people in that environment. And so uh, I've seen the value of that sort of thing. However, my bigger concern is the uh, erosion of preaching inside the church, where, you know, I talked to a fellow not too long ago who, who was uh, trying to find a different church. He wanted to move from his present church. He had been in his, the same church for seven years. And he wanted to move, and I asked him why, and he said, because he ran out of things to preach. And I said, you preached through the whole Bible in seven years? You know, I, 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 I can't imagine that. And th that guy was obviously a topical preacher. He, he was not a biblical expositor. And there's, there, there's not a sin about being preaching topically. I mean, I know there's a place for that. But the principal purpose of preaching is to set forth the Word of God. In Luther's last sermon, and some of you have heard me speak about this at various venues, that Luther's last sermon that he preached in 1546 in February was that he talked about his concern that after the Reformation had brought the gospel back to light and that was being preached now in every pulpit in Germany, he said the people were still now running to Trier and Aiken and places like that because they had a pair of Joseph's pants in one of these towns and some straw from the manger and another reliquary there in Germany. And, and Luther said, well, you know, people think that the power is in Joseph's pants. We don't do that in the evangelical church today, but we think the power is in the method where the place that God has put the power is in the Word. And if we want to have a powerful ministry, we have to be faithful to the Word, and we communicate the Word, and then get out of the way, and let the power operate. But the power is not in my abilities of rhetoric or eloquence, none of that. It's in how faithful and accurate I expound the Word of God in the church. That has to happen. Yes. This has to do with preaching and, and our, our call and our main focus. I'm bombarded with uh, requests and even being condemned because people are telling me that my duty is to rescue the culture and to, to fight against the effects of darkness in our culture and 
I've always seen my duty to, is to preach the gospel in the church and out of the church, but primarily to preach. If people don't get saved, how do we, we're not going to clean the culture. It's not that I don't care about my country. I do care, and I'm, I'm as disturbed and troubled as what's going on as anybody else is, but I don't think that we can rescue the culture simply by political means. If, if, if men were saved, then they would live differently. And that's the, that's the problem. So, so am, I, am I correct in resisting the, the effort to rescue the culture of my community and concentrate on preaching the gospel or do I, people tell me, well, you can do both. I, I don't know how you do both. I don't know how you do that. A so. uh, couple of things. First of all, this country desperately needs a revival of the things of God. But if we had a revival like the Great Awakening, there's no guarantee that the culture would be changed. We've been through revival after revival after revival. The greatest revival in the history of Christendom was in the 16th century Reformation. And a part of that is that you go beyond revival. Re revival means new life, new converts, regeneration, quickening taking place. But when you're born again, you're spiritually a baby. And babies don't change cultures. Revivals don't become reformation until or unless those who are regenerate become adults in their understanding of the things of God. And so it's not enough to evangelize people, but that's why those who have been evangelized have to be nurtured and grounded in the things of God so that their minds change and that and that they get the cultural values out of their head, and they're not conformed to this world, but they're transformed. And before we can have any impact on the culture, we have to be transformed ourselves. I really believe that. And then it happens. I mean, when, when the apostles started their ministry, they were working in one of the worst sewers of paganism the world had ever known in the Roman Empire. It was decadence with a vengeance. In one sense, that perhaps it wasn't as, as decadent as our country because we've been inoculated to Christianity, and we're no longer a neo-paganism. We're a neo-barbarianism in the American culture. Now, let me add to that. The church has not been given the same call as the state, Romans 13 tells us that the state is ordained by God. I was invited to give the uh, inaugural prayer breakfast address to a governor of Florida a few years ago, and I told him, this is your ordination day, because your task is ordained by God, and you are ordained to God, and you are answerable to God. You're not answerable to the church. You're not answerable to me, and I'm not asking the government to be the church. But I'm asking the state to be the state as God has created it. And throughout biblical history, starting with the Old Testament prophets, one of the tasks of the prophet was to give what we call prophetic criticism to the government, not to become the church, but like in our day, the great scandal of our culture, I believe, is abortion. It's, it's a spiritual and physical holocaust in this country. And when the church speaks against it, right away we say, we believe in separation of church and state. But what the state is saying today is that they want the separation of the state from God. The secular state has declared its, its uh, independence from God and claims autonomy. And the primary raison d'etre, the reason for the state in the first place, primarily is to protect, maintain, and nurture human life. And that's not happening. So the culture's in real trouble, and the government's in real trouble. But I 
in the final analysis, I agree with you. And it, one of the things, you know, that Ligonier has to worry about is we have a lot of resources to take care of time, people, finances, and so. And if you're in charge of those things in your church, you know that the primary task of the executive is the allocation of resources, allocation of people, of, of property, of tools, of finances. And we also know that if I have $100, I can waste it and do $5 worth of ministry and waste $95. But if I have $100 worth of, of, of money, one thing I can't do is do $105 or $110 worth of ministry. I'm limited by the resources I have. And my task is to allocate those resources because I know if I spend $5 here, I can't spend it over here. Now, you take that with respect to your time and your energy and your vocation. I believe that your primary vocation is the preaching of the Word of God to the congregation that God has put you in front of. And as you equip them for ministry, and as they grow in grace, they're going to be touching up against people all around the culture. But I think your investment should be overwhelmingly, chiefly, on the people of God to raise them up, rather than to try to change the government. And I mean, but I still think we have to exercise prophetic criticism of the state and that sort of thing, but that's not our primary task. Uh, paganism will always be with us. Uh, I, I, if you read Jonathan Edwards in the middle of the 18th century, 1750, before the Revolutionary War, you know what his biggest concern is in some of his writings? The erosion of Christianity in the colonies. The early Puritans and pilgrims came with the Mayflower contract in 1620 by 17, 130 years later. <laughs> the culture was basically secular. And we're still arguing about whether the founding fathers of the Republic were Christians and so on. You know, <laughs> it was already post Christian before George Washington ever, you know, took the oath of office. But so, I mean, we're always having to deal with the culture in which we are as pilgrims and strangers and aliens. Yes. Dr. Sproul. Yes. Uh, it's good to see you, and um, you look much younger than the picture. <laughs> uh, here's, here's my question. Um, 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 how do we deal with uh, application when we preach? Um, you know, sometimes I feel um, if I emphasize um, the application, it seems to me that what makes it different uh, with other religions, you know, there are a lot of moral teachings in Hinduism and Islam and even in Buddhism. So I think, well, in that case, I should just disregard the application and just focus on the uh, true meaning of the scripture. And I even, um, some of the professors in um, seminary, um, they even taught us that um, you are not allowed to preach to the lay people that they are to be David or they are to be Abraham because they are um, typology and they are linked to Jesus and you are not allowed to apply and tell them that you should be like David or you should be like Abraham. But on the other side, you know, I feel, well, if I don't do application, it's not well enough. Because if I just emphasize on the true meaning and the expository sermon only, I mean, why don't people just go Google and you know, buy books from Amazon? And there's my tension. And um, do you get what I'm saying? No, oh, I understand yeah, what yeah. you're saying. And the, I think we heard the answer to that question tonight in Steve's address in the first part of it, where he distinguished between teaching and preaching. That's always been a fuzzy thing for me because I tend to preach when I teach and teach when I preach. But I do know the difference. And when he talked about preaching is more than just communicating the information, it's more than doing the exegesis. You should do all of that. You need to understand the content of the text that you're preaching, and you need to expound that text. But with that exposition comes comforting, admonishment, 
You know? And that's, that's all part of the application, is uh, you, you have to help people see what the significance for their life is of what they've just heard from the Word of God. The Puritans were great at that. Edwards was a, a master of that. He would give this fantastic exposition of the text for so long, and then it'd always end with the application. I'm not very good of it, good, frankly, because I've spent too many years as a teacher. Most of my preaching is just unfolding the text, and then I remember, yeah, I've got to explain this, apply this text to these people. <laughs> but, uh, but no, we should do. We should try to apply it, but we can't. There are those who want to just exegete, and that's not preaching. And there are other preachers that all they want to do is give application, and, and there's no biblical content. So that's not preaching either. So it has to be both the content and the application, the content of the lives of the people. Okay? Yes? In, in light of what we've heard tonight on, on the, the gravity of preaching and, and the dearth of you know, good expository preaching, the famine of the word and, and of hearing the word. And um, in light of that, there seems to be what I've noticed in some churches anyway, uh, an unwritten rule that, you know, if you're not saying the benediction by noon, then, you know, you need to shorten your sermon up or, or do something different. In light of the significance and importance of preaching, how do we address that kind of attitude in, in the congregation? And is there a, an ideal length for a sermon? You know, they tell us in these church growth things that with the advent of television and sound bites and that the people's attention span is 12 minutes or 15 minutes, and so if you're going to... Uh, uh, communicate with them. You have to limit your sound bites to what people can take. And then they'll go to a f stadium and sit there for three hours and gross to watching a football game. <laughs> and so, you know, so, you know they, don't, they don't do uh, professional football with sound bites or with impressions. I mean, you got to... On the other hand, I used to tell my students in the, in the seminary, Steve heard me say this, you've got to earn the right to preach for 45 minutes because not too many people can do it. Uh, and it's a sin to bore people. And so uh, I try to do my sermons in 30 to 35 minutes on Sunday mornings, 50 minutes on Sunday night. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, say this very candidly. The next person who complains to me that I am preaching too long will be the first one in 13 years of my preaching at St. Andrews. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there in the congregation who don't believe that I preach too long. I'm sure there are people who said that. They've just never said that to me. And I've never heard that complaint uh, either third hand or whatever, and yet I've had scores of people complain to me that my sermons are too short. What a great situation to be in. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> when I was in the eighth grade, our supervising principal came to our school he was in charge of supervising four different schools in the district. And our, we had, we, our grade school went up to eighth grade. Then you went on to high school. And at the end of the eighth grade, all the schools were coming together to have a school picnic at the end of our graduation. And we were on the student council, and we were trying to plan that event. And we had a debate as to how long we should have this picnic. And the supervisor said to us that day, he said, you know, you always want to finish when the people want more than finishing when they've had too much. And that stuck with me. You know, I, I've made application of that sermon <laughs> to what happens Sunday morning. But you need to be your own best critic. How long can I really 
preach effectively and hold people's interest. You know, the Puritans would preach for an hour, two hours, but that was expected on Sunday morning. Now, here you're not accommodating the culture, but you, you're really swimming against the stream when, pe when you expect people to sit there for an hour or two hours to listen to you preach. And so you have to, you have to make that self-evaluation. Can I really communicate effectively for longer than 30 minutes? If you can, do it. If you can't, don't. You know, I hear so many sermons that would have been so much better had they stopped 15 minutes before they did. Okay? Yeah. As men studying, preparing, and leading our churches in worship, after we have led our church in preaching through worship, the response that follows, for I'm a younger pastor, and of course we see what the contemporary church is doing following the worship through preaching. But I would like to know what you do maybe at St. Andrew's. I've read some of Calvin's prayers following his preaching through worship, which are incredible. And I think that is a good conclusion to the preaching through worship. But following that, what would you recommend or have you believe leads and continues the spirit of worship before a benediction is given at the end of a service? You know, a few years ago, I, I spoke at the Christian Booksellers Association on their Sunday morning. I think there were like 7,000 people there. And that was maybe the fourth or fifth time I'd done that. So it's got to be old hat. But they came up to me and they explained that how long the service was going to be. And they said, we're going to have 45 minutes of worship. And then we're going to have your sermon. And so we had a praise band, and we had all that stuff for 45 minutes. And that was the worship segment of the service. And I said, am I from another planet? <laughs> what? Is, is the sermon not integral to worship? Is the pastoral prayer not part of worship? Is the taking up of the tithes and offerings not part of worship? Where did we get this idea that the songs were the worship and the rest of the stuff wasn't? Now, when you ask that question, he disappeared. I don't know where you went, but whoever it was that asked that question, there you go. You said, when we're leading worship. Did everybody hear him say that? You know, we've heard this admonishment and exhortation tonight from Steve that we'd be faithful to the gift of preaching. And if you have the gift of preaching, let him preach. But let me tell you what else you're in charge of. If you're the preacher, you're in charge of the worship. So we got, now we have churches all over the place where we have the worship minister and the, and the minister. What? What? What is that? I mean, these worship guys, have they gone this, all this time to seminary and study the Word of God like, like you are supposed to be prepared for this ministry? You're in charge of the worship. And let me tell you who else is not in charge of the worship. The people. You're the pastor of the flock. Do the, do the sheep come up to the shepherd and say, now here's what we would like to eat this afternoon. Uh, and here's, here's the kind of music we really dig. Huh? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Don't poison my sheep. Feed my sheep. Don't starve my sheep. They're his sheep. And worship is to be designed as preaching was. The goal of preaching, you just said, was what? The glory of God. Our, and we need to have a hard look at that. We do that regularly at St. Andrews. You asked me about that, St. Andrews. We have a worship committee of the church, and we look at every single thing we do on Sunday morning. And we say, is this biblical? Is this to the glory of God? Or is this a cultural accretion? Is it just something we're trying to do to be popular? And... Uh, and, and I think we need to criticize ourselves on that because the temptation is overwhelming to give the sheep whatever the sheep are buying for, you know. Oh, we're poor little sheep. Bah. Yeah. 
You got you to care about the sheep, care enough about the sheep to feed them what they need. Okay? Yeah. Uh, first of all, Dr. Sproul, uh, many thanks and praises to God for you and your ministry. Echo uh, heartily what's already been offered this evening, and I personally thank you. But you're not going to stand there and cry about it like Steve. I am not going to cry like Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. And there's no such thing as sanctified magic. I want to go on record as saying that. So. <laughs> but but uh, my question, it take just <laughs> made, made an enemy. It'll take just a moment to develop. But um, I read an article this week, and it was praising this new microprocessor technology that's been released by uh, IBM, I think. And uh, the technology is based upon... Um, the principles of quantum mechanics, and, and the article is extolling all of the, the, the magic that's associated with quantum mechanics, and, and in the article actually talks about the Heisenberg principle, and the electron is in more places than one. You know, right. It's in multiple places It's not any more places than one. It's here and not there at the same time, the same relationship. That's right, but that's not what the article said. Yeah. It, it, the article said in more places than one. Um, and, and where I'm going with that is it seems that our culture swallows down anything that science would say even when science speaks absurdly. What impact is that having on our congregations? Because that's sort of, you know, in the educational channel coming up. And then how do we as pastors address that in our preaching and our teaching that goes on inside the church? There's some good news and some bad news associated with that. Recently, was it the Wall Street Journal, whatever, had that major article from Stephen Hawking, where Stephen Hawking was declaring that we don't need to be looking at creation anymore because the laws of physics, quantum mechanics, and all that sort of thing. Now we know that the universe came into being through spontaneous generation and through self-creation, right? And people take him seriously. <laughs> they take him seriously. And here's a man who's an educated man, a brilliant man, making nonsense statements. Nothing ever created itself. To create itself would have to be before it was. It would have to be and not be at the same time, same relationship. And the difficulties and the mysteries of the Heisenberg mechanics principle give now pe people the license to speak absurdities without being challenged. Get away with it. There was a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist out at Stanford a few years ago who wrote an essay in which he said, the days of proclaiming Spontaneous generation are over. Now we know in contemporary scientific con uh, ideas that the enlightenment principle of spontaneous generation is no longer a tenable idea. Nothing can come into being spontaneously by itself. It takes time. <laughs> Stop me if I'm lying. And so he says what we have to do is change the paradigm Listen to this. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Gradual spontaneous generation. <laughs> and the idea is you can't get something from nothing quickly. <laughs> you, you have to be patient, you know, <laughs> and wait for it. Oh, my goodness sakes. Now, here's how Christians re respond to that. And what has happened is our congregation are filled with people who have now been taught that the categories of rationality no longer apply to the seeking of truth, and that truth can be contradictory. In fact, the more contradictory it is, the more likely it is that it's really truth. See? That is insanity. It really is insanity. And, but we have people thinking in those categories. And what I hear well-meaning teachers saying and preachers saying is, that the way in which people learn has been dramatically impacted by television and other electronic media to such a degree that the constituent nature of man has changed. So that if you want to get to the heart, you don't need to worry about getting through the mind. Let me give you something. Since the, creation, the dawn of creation, the constituent nature of human beings has not changed one iota. The way in which God created you was that the avenue to the heart is through the mind. 
Always. That's why we seek to persuade men with a careful proclamation of the gospel. And we try to get that information into their heads. And we know it can get into the heads and never go anywhere else, and that's no good. But if you try to get it into their hearts without getting into their heads, that's not faith, it's superstition. And you're not really being faithful to the Word of God. So we have to disavow ourselves of that myth that the nature of mankind has changed. I still address the mind of people. I still seek to be logical in my presentation. And then people say, wow, I never thought about it like that before. And I say, that's a great idea. Wow. And I say, I know. <laughs> Guys, you'll be up first for the Q&A tomorrow, okay? <laughs> so ju just you come up first and we'll take it from there. We need to wrap the evening up. Keith, would you come and lead us in Soldiers of Christ Arise? And then John and Nabnet will dismiss us. Uh, Dr. Sproul will be preaching first thing in the morning on the holiness of God. Uh, you're going to want to be here early and to get a good seat. And he'll be speaking on the wrath of God tomorrow afternoon. And we have another Q&A. For about 23 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, Keith, would you come? If you've got your uh, program, you'll see the words, To Christ Arise. Uh, let's lift up our voice. Let's stand up now and sing to the Lord. remain standing and once again I look forward to seeing all of you in the morning at 7.30 for breakfast and the first session beginning at 9. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is in the name above all names that we bow before you tonight. We do not come to you in the name of a man. We do not come before your throne tonight in the name of a church. We come to you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for you and for who you are, not just for what comes from your hand, but God, for the privilege of being able to behold your glory and to have the relationship with you in and through your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you tonight for the gifts you have given to the body of Christ in and through these men and for their ministries and for their churches. And Father, I pray that in this evening and tomorrow throughout the hours of the day that we as Christ Fellowship Baptist Church may be able to love on them and encourage them 
and through the teaching and preaching of Dr. Sproul and Dr. Lawson, equip them that they may go back and boldly proclaim the truth of your word. Father, I pray as we go our separate way tonight that you would be with us, may your hedge of protection be around us, and may all that we do be pleasing in your sight for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name, amen. amen. on? You have me? Okay.